we're going to spend the next 50-ish minutes, which are here by six, um, doing some, some critiques. So we got through a lot of content in the last hour and a half, right? And what I want to do now is spend some time thinking about how we might put some of those things into practice. Right, so we, at the beginning of the, the hour, around 3.30, I had you find some examples of good and bad visualizations. I didn't ask you to tell me how to improve those at, the, at that time, but now I'm going to have you actually do that. I'm going to have you pick one or two of these and then figure out how would you actually improve these and actually draw out that process. So we're going to do this in a, a, a fairly structured way, okay? And we're going to base these visualization critiques on... Um, some critique theory that comes from traditional art critiques. So like I said, we're going to base this on a traditional art critique. So a traditional art critique does essentially four things. So the first thing it says is to describe what you see, right? If you look at a piece of art, you have to describe what is it that you see in that piece of art. And that could be something as simple as Describing the scene, describing the, the color choices, describing the, the emotions that are evoked by that. The next thing you do is you analyze that piece of art. So you ask, how is the work organized at sort of different levels of interpretation? You interpret that work of art. You ask, what is the artist saying? What are they trying to communicate? And then you decide, is this a successful piece of art? Right? Is it good? Is it bad? So we can utilize this sort of framework for doing the same thing with visualizations, right? Because we're often doing the same kinds of critical um, assessments with the visualization. So we, we would describe what do we see in the charter graph, right? We analyze what are the visual encodings, where the marks and channels are used, and what attributes do those, do those encode. What's different, though, is we ask this question about task. So what is the purpose of the visualization? So this is similar to asking what the artist, artist is trying to communicate with a piece of art, right? But now we're asking, what is the person who created this charter graph trying to communicate, right? Because that person is a designer. They are the artist who created the charter graph. And then based on that task, based on our assessment of what that purpose is, we can ask, is this a successful visualization? Do they achieve the task that they intend to achieve? So we're going to think about this framing um, sort of through the lens of the, all of the four things that we talked about in the lecture part, right? So composition, color, clarity, and dimensionality. And think about the extent to which the designer effectively uses these different components of the visualization to achieve that task at hand. So there are some basic rules for doing any critique, and this is true of critiques with visualizations as well. So the first rule is that you must use a neutral voice, right? So you can't just say you don't like something or that you like something just off the bat without being critical about that and expressing that in a way that's very neutral and not motivated by emotion. The second rule is that your critique must be fact-driven, right? So that's just a, a way of saying that you can't just make any statements about visualization, say it's good or bad, and not back up with some sort of critical assessment of what it is about that visualization that's really bad. And then the, the third rule is that your critique must have a clear goal, right? So in this case, we provide alternative solutions, and I'll have you actually draw out alternative solutions, right? So if, if a visualization is not successful, why is that the case? And how can you improve it? And how can you draw out those improvements yourself? We will do this process of critiquing visualizations. I have some handouts right here that we'll work with. And these handouts sort of guide you through these questions that we should be asking of any visualization. So the first is, who is the intended audience? Right? So for whom did the person who made this visualization intend this visualization? And what does that imply or have consequences for how we interpret that visualization? What information does the visualization represent? Right? Was it actually communicating? What data is actually present and encoded in the data set? How many data dimensions does it encode and how? Well, list several tasks, comparisons, or evaluations it enables. So one of the important functions of visualization is that it should allow analysis. It should facilitate comparison. So we'll actually list out 
what things that visualization enables through that design. What make the visualization good or bad, right? So what principles of excellence or best practices make it good or bad? Can you suggest any improvements? And then finally, why do you like or dislike this visualization? So again, going through this process of describing what you see, analyzing the way it's constructed, listing out the tasks that are intended by the visualization, and then finally making an assessment, deciding is this a good or bad visualization and why. So I have a couple of examples for us to just sort of walk through as a group to give you a sense of how this might look. So here is a visualization, infographic, whatever you might call it, um, showing the relationship between different presidential terms, uh, classified documents, and number of documents that have been declassified across all those different presidencies. Right, so in this particular visualization, you can ask all these different questions in order. So who do you think would be the intended audience for a visualization like this? public? Yeah, I would say so. This comes from The Atlantic, right? So it's it's built and sort of designed by journalists and journalists went for the general public. That's pretty good presumption. What information does this visualization represent? Yeah. Pretty basic. I already said that, right? So question by any standard. How many data dimensions does it encode? There are a few different ones. What are all those data dimensions? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to... So this says pages to classify. These are years. These are residencies. This says documents classified. The rest of the stuff you don't really need. Yeah, so what's encoded here? What's that? Yeah. Can you be specific? But isn't what you just said being encoded, or do I not understand what you mean by being encoded? Isn't it number of pages, presidency, or is something else? Yeah. So it's a combination of that and the actual kinds of marks and channels that are being used. Right, so in this case, one of our marks is this line chart in the background. So that's an encoding. We also have color. color. Oh, this, that doesn't really serve as much of an encoding um, function as much as it does sort of just a distinguishing function. Right, being able to tell the difference between different, um, sort of the hierarchical organization of the charts. But, but what is the difference between distinguishing and encoding? Sorry. So I'm looking for um, actual marks or channels that encode attributes in the data. Oh, like the number of pages. Yeah. So like color in this case doesn't encode an attribute. It just serves a function of making it easier to tell the difference between like, the line in the background and the, the pages. I'm actually not really sure if, so this is a little confusing to me because I think the, like there's a slight gradient difference in color up to this line and then behind it. So, and it's, it's unclear to me what exactly that is encoding, if anything, because one of my first guesses is that it has, it might have something to do with either the magnitude of a line or the magnitude of the pages. But it doesn't match up, right, because it's darker here and darker here, and those are inverse relationships. Thank you. 
So this is, these are all fair assessments, right? These are important parts of doing a critique, is determining what is and actually isn't an encoding, and if it's an encoding, is it doing that accurately or well? So that's, so that gets me to this next question, right? So this is about past comparisons or evaluations in the Right, so there, there's a bunch of stuff you could do with this, right? There are a bunch of different kinds of pairwise comparisons that you can do. And part of that process is looking at those comparisons one by one and deciding, does this particular representation facilitate that kind of comparison effectively, right? So maybe part of, part of this task of listing the tasks and comparisons and evaluations is determining, does this make sense, right? Can I interpret this correctly? So the last few questions here, right? So what principles of excellence best describe why it is good or bad? Can you suggest improvements to your life with a subject situation? As a whole, what do you think about this? Also, the the element of we're working at three dimensions, which makes comparison, for one thing, not accurate, and another thing, superfluous. Right? Because we have if we're encoding documents classified as line parts, but it's it's actually a ninety degree angle from the axis in which we're encoding pages classified. So even if you recognize that you're doing comparison between documents and pages as a first step, even if you get to, get to that point, you're sort of stuck with the fact that you're doing this weird comparison on two different axes. They're three different, three different dimensions. Right? So, I mean, if I were to improve this, I would just scrap this whole thing and just do a line chart and a bar chart. If my objective is purely to communicate the data and this data sets, what I would do is not include all of these unnecessary things that really obscure our interpretation and readability. Yeah. Isn't the value the fact that it was given to the general public to want to make it through? It's a matter of opinion whether it's visual or not. Because that's part of what makes this really anything like that. So that's definitely an aspect to think about, and that gets back to this idea of making visualizations semantically and experientially relevant. Like there is something to be said about this being eye-catching, right? So if your intention is to point people's attention to this and do it in a way that's very fast, like this does that effectively, arguably, right? But if your intention is for people to do accurate comparisons, then this is not the best option, right? So journalism is actually an interesting domain in which these things are often intention, because you're often working at this weird intersection of constraints on a physical media space, right? Maybe in a news article or on a screen, as well as the, the constraints on attention of the people who are reading, right? So if you're trying to tell the public about something important, but you have limited space and they have limited time to read, often you want something that's just very effective, very fast. So all of these things are very different. 
so if I contrast that with something that maybe will look more familiar in the sciences specifically, how would you feel about something like this? So who thinks this is a good visualization? <laughs> I hope nobody. Yeah, and I don't even... I, this is one of those things where I'm not even sure where to begin because I... Because it, it's, clearly, it's clearly trying to say a lot and good for them, but at the same time, this could be 20 different charts and graphs, right? And that would make it much easier to read. But nature charges you like $800 per day. <laughs> right, so there's a constraint on resources, right? So there's, there's a lot going on in this, right? There are lots of encodings. We have encodings by position, by size, by opacity, by color, uh, by marker style, by orientation. This is actually, I don't know if you can tell, but there's A, B, C, D. This is actually four parts that have been put together. So I guess if you are a scholar in the field, you know what's going on, perhaps this makes total sense. But I would argue from a pure design perspective, this is not designed well at all. Right? There, there are theoretically lots of comparisons and evaluations and enables, but we don't, the cognitive load required to understand what's going on overshadows the ability to do those evaluations. Okay. So we have things on different extremes here. Yeah. So, so I guess it's, I mean, this looks like a reviewer number two comment said, why don't you compare all of these conditions? So we put it in one graph. But who pushes back on that? Should, should the editors of the journals? Should the, should the scientists? I'm always of the opinion that the responsibility first and foremost comes to the scientist. And if it's the case that you have decided that you're going to communicate a data set in a particular way, and the publisher pushes back against that, and you have no choice, then you're going to have to make some sacrifices about the clarity of your visualization, or the, the particular charts and graphs that you choose. Given no constraints, the responsibility is that of the scientist. But I know that's, that's not always practical. Yeah. Possibly. Or I honestly would just. I honestly would start with just different graphs for each thing, for each different kind of comparison. I also am not in this field, so I don't know what kinds of comparisons, like pairwise dimensional comparisons, would be important. So maybe a child display would be useful for this by the better sense of. Um, what that might look like, but it's just, it's so many different kinds of variables being included simultaneously that, um, as a very first step, it doesn't need to all be one. So again, we have intuitions about this, right? We, we can tell when something is done effectively and not done effectively, and even more importantly, we can situate that sort of assessment within a context that understands who the, the visualization is intended for, right? And who made it and for what purpose? And these are all very important things to consider. So I'm going to have you, again, break out into your small groups that you started with. And before you had found right, two to three examples of good and two to three examples of bad visualizations. So what I want you to do now is to, as a group, find two to three visualizations, perhaps from that set, or maybe a different set that you find on your own, to, to critique. So these should be examples of charts and graphs that are interesting to critique. Right? So maybe one or two that are good, and there are many that are bad. And really think very critically about why it's good and why it's bad. And then once you do that, I'm going to have you actually draw out with your markers a reimagining 